Yes, great. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is ACDC, Aerosali and Collective Dynamic Change. And uh, my name is Aerosali. I'm a Transition Wealth Advisor, and I love helping single professional women to rearrange their finances so they can uh, get out of bed quicker, retire faster. And mostly I help them when they are going through a transition. So if you know anyone that has gone through divorce, separation, lost a loved one, please let them know that I can help. And I'm here with my partner, Colette, with a special guest. So Colette, can you introduce yourself and introduce our guest? Of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Colette Rabba. I am a real estate broker in the GTA. I sell anywhere from, uh, well, you know, really pretty much anywhere uh, west of a young street, I want to say, <laughs> which is a lot, but mostly my areas of expertise are Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington. That's what I like to stay in, but you can talk to me about anything. And that's why we do the show. And we love to have guests just like Amira Khan, who is a wonderful lawyer, real estate lawyer that is here with us today from Ask Law and Barrister. And her website is asklawfirm.ca. So she's really easy to find and very easy to talk to. And I really wish you would welcome her. Thank you, Amira, for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and as, as Colette said, yes, I'm Amira from Ask Law. My practice is located in Milton, Ontario. However, um, the area um, of practice is much wider. I'm a lawyer in Ontario, so I can practice um, uh, law anywhere in Ontario, but specifically, I'm a real estate lawyer. I complete sale, purchase, and refinance transactions. I My um, range of clients uh, is from residential to commercial. Uh, we do both uh, kinds of transactions, and in residential, we look after first-time home buyers, investors, uh, retirees, um, name it, and we're able to help them out. Wow, that is awesome. Thank you for being here. So the reason that you are coming the, uh, to the show is because we have a question that is coming up over and over again. And I think that from your, the point of view of a lawyer it would be easier uh, if people want to ask some questions, they know how to contact you. But it is for first home buyers, right? I know that this is their first transaction. They have no idea what they're walking into. And I think some of the things that lawyers can explain, and I like your all your explanations are very simple. People can know where they're walking into. So um, Colette, I know you have prepared some questions for Amira, so we can get started. Well, the, the first, so when Amira and I first started talking, you know, one of the things that we said was like, I've been, you know, I'm, I can't say I'm perfect. Nobody is perfect, but, uh, with, um, you know, you have so many years of experience that you see the more common issues with what's coming across your desk. Uh, so same thing with me when I'm either on the buying end or on the selling end, I'll see what the other agent is writing in their clauses. If they're presenting, uh, to me, that's usually the way it works. Right? So I have a listing, uh, if somebody wants to make an offer they bring an agreement to me and then they have to write in certain clauses. They have to write in certain details about the offer. So conditions on finance, conditions on a whole bunch of other things. So the one thing that I, when Amira and I were talking were like, what do you see the most common, not problems, but things that you might, things may arise you know, when the two parties don't agree and then it comes to you and you go, well, hold on a second, you know, they didn't write in any conditions on this or there is a after the fact when it closes, they come back to you and say, oh, hey, um, what do I do about this or what happens with that? So that's what I really want to talk about today is like, yeah. what do you see is the most common issues with uh, an agreement before it comes to you or like, you know, during the, the process or once everything has been signed, that's usually when the lawyers get it. So what are the questions that some of the first time buyers ask you? So um, before we commence, this is, I do want to give a disclaimer, like any lawyer would, this uh, conversation is solely by way of information. I do not intend to provide any legal advice in this particular uh, session. 
if someone has a, a specific question, by all means, get in touch with me. I'll be happy to give my time and uh, provide proper legal advice um, given the specific situation. So this is just general information for buyers or first time buyers. And um, uh, as uh, Colette was asking me, um, sorry, I was just looking at a note I had written down. So first time home buyers, the first thing that they always, always ask is they're very um, uncertain of the entire process of the closing. That's a very common question we get asked. And uh, the process really at my end is if uh, they have approached our office to complete a purchase transaction for them, uh, one of the lawyers, we're two lawyers at the office, one of the lawyers will go step by step in terms of explaining the process to them over the phone, how our office operates, how the transaction is completed. So this is um, something very commonly uh, requested uh, to, to explain to them um, what happens when. They're typically eager to finish everything very quickly. And we have to tell them that, yes, you've given the agreement to us. You've retained us as your lawyer. And at this point, I need to do my work with the seller's lawyer, send out my requisitions, um, and also for me to receive mortgage instructions. Till such time I have mortgage instructions from whichever lender the buyer has chosen, I cannot complete the transaction for them. So, um, and, and as I explained to my clients is that once I have the mortgage instructions, that is when we're meeting for signing of the closing documents. Uh, typically, that is also when my clients provide their down payment to me. Money comes to my trust account. It stays with the lawyer. Um, the, uh, the lender's money also comes to the uh, lawyer and it stays in my trust account. It is held in trust for the buyers. And uh, on the day of closing, there's exchange of money. Uh, the funds are paid to the seller. And uh, in return, we receive a key for the property. Now, just a point to remember is that these days during COVID meetings are typically uh, over video chats. Uh, so we complete electronically or even if hard copies are being signed, the meeting still is a video chat. Uh, there's no in-person meeting these days. And the exchange of keys is such as well that lawyers provide us lockbox codes. And we do the same as well with help of the realtors, of course. So uh, these days, realtors will help us, out, uh, help us out, keep a lockbox at the property till the closing is complete and we exchange the code on closing. So my clients will then, at the end of the day, uh, will receive a lockbox code. Keys are never, never released prior to closing. Uh, keys will always only come to my clients once the money has been provided to the seller. So this is a very common question they need to know what will happen and yes. how things will happen yeah the other common questions are expenses of course typically the kind of expenses a buyer needs to keep in mind are um the closing costs with the lawyer legal fees plus disbursements disbursements are um typically third-party payments, search costs with the land registry, registration expenses, bank expenses, courier expenses. Most lawyers, um, from what I understand, including our office, are able to give a lump sum amount of legal fee disbursements plus HSTs. Two figures that we cannot provide an answer to right away, we do need more information for that, is land transfer tax and title insurance cost. So, um, Am Am Amira, uh, so how long does this typically take? Like, when do they they have to engage you? And how long does it actually take? Like, is the closing day exactly or can it be extended? How does that work? So once you have a firm agreement, uh, my advice would always be to confirm a lawyer at that point, even if there are uh, three months still remaining to the closing date. Uh, I would, I would actually, I tell my clients to get a lawyer even before they purchase, so they have everything lined up. So sorry, can I answer that? Sure. Um, as far as how long the process takes. Uh, for other agents to know this, if they don't know this, you should not close, in my opinion, in Ontario, you should not close under two weeks at the very least. Is that correct, Amira? Do you feel like you can do it under two weeks? So um, I would agree with you. Two weeks is also a stretch. 
given our volume. So absolutely, yeah. um, I, I don't know a real estate lawyer that is sitting free these days. So <laughs> typically the buyer will be very hard pressed to find a lawyer who's able to accommodate them. Um, very short closings also raise red flags. And there's just a lot of questions at our end that why was a lawyer not retained early on. So right. just for everyone's peace of mind, including the lawyers, so that we have time to complete our work, um, please do retain a lawyer as early as possible. As yeah. soon as, at my end, I do need a firm agreement to start work on a file. So as soon as there is a firm agreement, or in the case of a purchase of a condo, uh, even a condo purchase with conditions for review of the status certificate, you do need a lawyer right away. Typically, uh, and correct me, Colette, if I'm wrong, I see three days uh, written as um, the timeline for review of the status certificate. Oh, I think that's way too low. Like, that's not enough time. I So, and that's the thing, when you write in these clauses, I if, if I'm the buying agent, I will write in 10 days and then I'll ask... Uh, you know, it's, it'll be up to the sellers to decide if that's too long or if it's too short. So, and sometimes it doesn't go the full 10 days, but if we can't get a status report and that takes about a week and then we get the status report, we don't want to run out of time. So, you know, that's something that from my end, I think that's very important before you hire a lawyer to make sure those clauses are written correctly and with a, the amount of time that you need as a buyer to fulfill those conditions or to waive the conditions. Uh, yes. Nicolette, before we move on, I just wanna make sure that the audience know what a status report is. Sure, status report is something that it's it has to do with condos. Do you wanna take this, Amir, or do you want me to do it? Sure. I can answer that. Okay, sure. So... <laughs> <laughs> you're sick of hearing me talk, I talk so much. <laughs> So if you're buying a condominium, there is a management company that manages the condominium. It's typically called the condo management. There are various corporations and companies that manage the cleaning, the elevators, the upkeep of the condo. And for that, uh, there is a monthly fee that condominiums charge uh, to the residents. And when we're buying a, a condo, we need to know what is the health of that particular condominium uh, as well as that unit. And a status certificate report or a status certificate as we call it would uh, along with its uh, attachments will tell us whether the seller is up to date on their condo fees, whether there is any concerns of condo liens, are there any special assessments against the condo or not? as well as the general health of the condo, their reserve funds, how much money the condominium has in its pocket to look after their daily uh, expenses. Are there any litigation against them? What sort of a budget they have and what not? Um, and what rules and regulations a buyer or a resident must follow in order to live at that place? So uh, it will tell us what are parking rules and regulations, what are pets rules and regulations. So these things are reviewed by a solicitor before a condo purchase is firmed up so that the buyers know what they're buying. Ooh. Yes. And, and Thank you. there's so much, sometimes they're like, you know, this thick, they don't come on paper anymore. <laughs> That's the little old fashioned. And then, so what happened was that used to be on paper, then they turned it into a CD that you would have to order. And now it's all online. Usually. Thank God know. for that. <laughs> I, yeah. No kidding. So even I, as as a, an agent, a buying or selling agent, if I have a condo before I list it, I'll look at the, I'll see if they have one. And they they typically uh, expire too. They're not good for more than a month, is it? That is correct. However, yeah. um, when I'm reviewing one, I would want the latest one at the time of purchase. But it is not unusual for us to, for instance, um, review one in September, but the closing is in December, which means typically the status certificate would be three months old, but we're able to call the condo management, get confirmations. Um, and nothing has changed. Yeah, and, now and we do request our realtors also to add certain amendments before waiving to make sure that we have written confirmations from the seller if you need any uh, with, a, with respect to payments of uh, condo fees. Right, and the, the one is, thing that- is, uh, I have a question. Is okay. this done- for uh, new condos or resale condos or is it just one or the other that's okay. a long, long answer all condos whether it's okay. resale or builder. okay 
And the other thing too, if it's a new build, they might not even have a status report yet because the condo corporation hasn't been formed yet. So that gets well, tricky. Uh, typically, no. We uh, unless and until declarations are registered, they can't sell the unit. So uh, status certificates are available, but uh, we don't get to receive them a day or two before the closing. So the yeah. review process never happens with a new build uh, with your solicitor. However, we do acquire status certificate and we check if there are any issues and those issues are resolved prior to this. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing with resale condos is special assessments. So there are two, th and you know what, we're getting totally off topic because this is probably not a typical answer or, or thing that uh, um, uh, buyers are concerned with, but a special assessment is not your maintenance fee. This is a separate, fee that sometimes nobody is disclosing it so you have to make sure you look for it specifically because you know it's not a typical thing that happens but let's just say they're paying an extra hundred dollars a month until the windows have been paid off or something that's special that's yes. not a and we're seeing a lot of that colette i'm sorry to cut you off we're seeing a lot of that oh, during COVID. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, condos defer their monthly payments and um, there were special assessments for later months saying that, okay, fine, we won't collect condo fees in this, this, this month, but the following months there will be special assessments to collect the pending fees or any additional expenses condos had to take because of uh, COVID measures that they had to. Um, oh, see, I didn't even think about COVID. So yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of special assessments being put wow. in. Wow. Okay, good to know. Yeah. So make sure that it's written in uh, to any agreement that you have, because sometimes, you know, when it comes to the law and, and what has to be disclosed, if there is, an, it is a special assessment and it's not disclosed, is that a big deal after? Yes. Yeah, so um, status certificates, though, would always um, uh, disclose a special assessment unless there is a there is a mistake by the condo management and they forget. Um, but I want to go a step back and say if the buying agent doesn't write in that they want to see a, a status certificate. If there is no review of the status certificate, you go without conditions. Um, and there is a special assessment. I it will become the buyer's headache to do that. Exactly. That's what I wanted to say, because even though it might not be a common thing, and if you're, you're, you're working with a new realtor too, that doesn't know that there is such a thing as a status certificate, which, you know, is pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> they don't yeah. know that. But if you do, and, and that's something that not just if the, the realtor doesn't know how to do it, but if they're in multiple, um, you know, there, there's yeah. multiple. But I do have an answer to that. Um, okay. So what happens is we do see, uh, you're correct, uh, there are oftentimes given the market these days, uh, a condition for a status certificate review is not put in. That being said, as a lawyer, I still require a status certificate to complete the transaction. So even if there is no condition, I will still review the status certificate to make sure that the closing is done properly. It is about $100 uh, plus HST uh, typically, and it's uh, definitely a cost worth taking. And if a status certificate then at that point discloses to us that there is a special assessment, we do make sure that it's resolved prior to closing. Okay. And if there, by some odd stroke of bad luck, that is not disclosed or it happens to be, uh, uh, it is, it is uh, put in, after the closing, sure. Um, we do purchase title insurance. So title insurance will cover the buyer mm -hmm. for any unpaid condo fees or special assessments that were not disclosed to us prior to closing. Okay, that's, that's a good question. thing to know. Now, for uh, going back to the home buyers, the first home buyers, what would you say that is something that most home buyers don't expect or they are surprised by saying? Oh, I didn't know that I had to pay for this. So two things. <laughs> One that we rarely get is first time home buyers don't know uh, that there is something called the land transfer tax. The province mm -hmm. charges us, which is a substantial amount. Um, they are taken by a surprise because it, can, it goes in thousands. First time home buyers are uh, eligible for a rebate um, by the province as well as another expense that they need to keep in mind regarding land transfer tax is that if you're buying in Toronto, 
this tax is doubled. So Toronto City, the municipality charges it, as well as the province. And uh, the land transfer tax works in slabs. There is a very convenient online calculator available by the ministry. You just Google LTT calculation, plug in your purchase price, and it will tell you what the land transfer tax will be. And then also there's purchase. the Toronto land transfer tax on top of the Which is provincial. Double. Yeah. yeah. Great. Double yeah. land transfer. Yay. Yes. Yeah. So that. That typically is one of the surprises to buyers. Um, it, it happens, and especially if the market is uh, really uh, hot and up and coming, they tend to just calculate that we're putting in 5% or 10% down and they completely forget about costs, which yeah. are not included by the lender. The costs have to come out of the buyer's pockets. Absolutely, and, and that is, you know what, that's one of the things that I always work with my clients about. It says, listen, there's a lot of things. Not only you need the actual 5%, 10% or 20%, but it is the extra that you're going to be doing. And yes. it's not only the lawyer's fees or all of these things that you have explained, but also when they move, furniture doesn't fit yeah. now they don't have uh window shades all of those kind of things that they're pretty pricey if you're yeah. buying them uh first time right so uh, i completely agree with you on on the extra cost because i remember one of my clients after closing told me that he's left with just five hundred dollars in his account after just paying the lawyer fees and closing the property he had no funds to complete, to set up anything new, buy anything, you know, uh, $500 is, is very low to be in your account um, on the day of closing after paying expenses, of course, yeah. but this is, this is not how you would know. Uh, this is not how financial planning would work. Right? That's why buyers have to talk to Aristotle first to yeah. say, this should not be a surprise to you. This is something yeah. that everybody, and that's the funny thing too, that, you know, between, uh, uh, I talk to lawyers, I talk to mortgage brokers, and I find that the the lack, and, and I blame my industry, you know, our industry too, when it comes to other agents, that the agents really should be, um, you know, we're the first line of defense with the clients, and we should be telling buyers, this is what I, I can vouch for myself that I do tell, um, I do inform them, and I have a big, um, um, you know, question and answer <laughs> session first before we get started to go through all these things and especially with the agreement of purchase purchase and sale for them to understand what they're signing it's a big deal yes uh yeah. there's there are a lot of clauses in there and that sort of reminds me also with regards to uh, i think you had a question about chattels and fixtures yes um, my favorite <laughs> <laughs> That's a fancy, fancy words, right? Most and what people, 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 people might not even know that there's a difference between a chattel and a fixture. Chattel it means anything that is movable. Uh, and um, not attached. Not fixtures are affixed to the property. Thank you. So your fridge, washer, dryer, stove are all chattels. And that is why it is important to note them down in the uh, agreement. And the agreement is worded uh in a tricky manner also so for very chattels, specific it should yes, be it's, very specific for chattels the clause say, uh, is asking what chattels are included in the purchase so whatever the seller is looking to sell and leave behind at the property or the buyer needs to buy along with the uh, purchase of the property must be listed in the uh, agreement in the appropriate clause um, so that typically would have your washer, dryer, stove, fridge, um, some people sell their microwaves, a barbecue, whatever they want to leave behind, any special um, cabinets that are movable can, should be listed in the agreement as chattels included in the same. Right. Um, how there is there is the gray area. Yeah, that's what that's what messes people up because you know, like let's say a kitchen island, for example. Yes. <laughs> it's not really attached. Maybe it's not attached to anything. Maybe it is. Maybe uh the one that I see very, very often is the bathroom mirrors. You have this beautiful ornate mirror and you think, okay, it belongs to the bathroom. It's part of the set of the, the vanity and the mirror match. And then when they take possession, the mirror is gone because it was only hung by a nail, just like a photograph or, 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 or painting. So the law says that if it's affixed 
to the property, meaning it's nailed in, it's drilled in, it's part of the property and it should stay with the property. So if the island, which happened in one of my transactions, uh, there was a kitchen island and um, the kitchen island was uh, like a table. It wasn't affixed to the floor and the seller took it with them. And there was really no argument at our end to say that it should have stayed back because it was like a piece of furniture. It was not affixed to the property. Um, and the seller was right, rightfully took it with them. Uh, the buyers were under the impression that it is a kitchen island uh, uh, in a property that they bought has a kitchen island and they bought such a property, but unfortunately it was not included. Um, so it is best to uh, write it in the agreement clearly, and that is the rule for fixtures. So the clause is asking what is excluded as a fixture. So if a seller, this is really for the benefit of the seller, if a seller is very uh, particular about a chandelier or something that they want to take along with them, that must be noted in the agreement that this is excluded from the purchase um, and will be taken along with them. Or some realtors, which I do like, um, because the wording in the agreement can be tricky for some people to understand, they would just add a very a straightforward, uh, easy to understand clause in the schedule saying this is what will be taken with the seller. Seller will yes, take this like, with them like and the buyer will. Yeah. All electric light fixtures, for yeah. example. Yeah. So this, oh, yeah. is, this is very important for people because, you know, you're so excited about getting this house that you look at it and it says, oh my God, it looks so beautiful. And then you're assuming that you're getting the whole package and then you turn around and it's not. So to be safe, just write it down. Oh, make sure that that stays, yeah. right? Or that you know, stays or I want it in case the seller doesn't want to leave it, right? They can yeah, always negotiate. Right. But also... One, writing it specifically in the agreement. So whatever you want repaired or fixed even, please have it written in the agreement prior to firming it up. But at the same time, um, I do a lot of that. And I guess a lot of the realtors do that also. Let uh, might have a comment on it. Managing expectations of first-time home buyers or any buyer for that matter. Um, when you're buying a resale property, yes, there will be nails in the wall. There will be um, you know, some dings here and there. Um, this is not a brand new property. So you need to understand that as a lawyer, I'm not going to um, uh, encourage any of my clients to spend or worry too much about a scratch on the wall because this is a used property. This is not a brand new property with warranties that they're, they're buying. Yeah. So managing expectations is also part of what I do a lot. Um, and if some buyers are really concerned about um, uh, an issue at the property, which I cannot resolve because at the end of the day, my work, I'm a transaction lawyer and my work is to complete the transaction. And I do deal with other lawyers to fix issues and repairs. But if something cannot happen, then uh, clients, unfortunately, at times have to be sort of uh, directed towards small things for them to do. Well, the and 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 the one thing too, not just about things that are inside of the home or or part of the property. Um, the one thing that uh, I I always want to make sure of, and it's not I I'm not privy to that information. It has to you know we have to work together with our lawyers as well, and with the home inspect the home inspectors and any other information if we need. So let's just say somebody wants to buy a house that they want to renovate or they want to put an addition on. And you don't know where the setbacks are for the property. You don't know where, if there's an easement or an encroachment. These are big words. And the, the first time home buyer, we don't expect you to know what these are. But as a lawyer and a real estate agent, we both need to protect our clients to say, do you know that there is this easement on the property? Or do you know that there is this setback and you can't build this mega mansion right up to the sidewalk? Like it's just not going to happen. So if this is your expectation that you think that you can do that as a buyer, this is something you do before you sign any agreement to purchase. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so if you're looking to do any any renovations in a property, um, first thing first, they need permits from the city. So a lot of the time, uh, even if there are no setbacks or easements, I, I yet have to see a property without it, but uh, just hypothetically, you still at the very least require a permission and a permit from the city to do that. And well, again, city bylaws would require you to 
uh, do the construction a second way or i was gonna say even if you're buying a piece of property and you want to to build on it you should know what you're buying and where those lot lines are so to have a survey is very important to me anyway uh you know if that's something that you live in a neighborhood that's already been established you may already have a survey but it's something that you don't know what you're buying if if you go by the listing and the listing will say hey we're not sure that this is what you're buying but that's up to the the buyers to do the due diligence to say yes this is what we see on public record and that might not be something that i i could even see that's really up to the lawyer to determine the yes lawyer, however as a lawyer i do want to add a point on surveys is that an old survey is of no use to us uh, we don't know what other constructions have been done when was the okay, survey when you say was... old when you say old how old so uh, an up-to-date survey is that is done at that time and no changes have been made to the property afterwards. So um, a survey could be a month old and a deck was put in after and it's of no use to us. I need to know the current situation um, at the property. So uh, also typically people have old surveys, they'll write a line in the agreement that the seller will provide an existing survey um, that really is of it can give you an idea, but as a lawyer, I will not issue an opinion on an old survey ever. That being said, uh, we do purchase title insurance and title insurance is a whole different topic that I would love to talk more about and explain a lot to the buyers in, in terms of what title insurance is, what coverages it's giving. But type, part of the coverage that title insurance does provide is uh, any boundary disputes, any issues with regards to encroachments that were not disclosed at the time. And that stays after the, the purchase, after the- After the purchase, purchase yes. Okay. So, um, and in that regard, if uh, a survey was available, an up-to-date good survey was available, the client does not get coverage from the title insurance. It's like any insurance, so in health insurance, if unfortunately a person has cancer, insurance is not going to cover them for that particular right. cancer. So yeah. same word for title insurance in our field, that if uh, a issue was revealed in a survey, that issue needs to be fixed by the lawyers prior to closing, title insurance will not cover that issue for you. But so in that sense, it's best to go sort of blindsided in there and uh, purchase the property. Though we do check boundaries, we do check um, uh, adjoining houses and whatever easements are registered are disclosed. But when it comes to construction, I do not provide advice with regards to construction. The client needs to get in touch with the city and get permits. Part of the uh, process of getting permits is where the city will disclose what kind of utility easements are available uh, are have been registered um, what sort of boundaries does the client need to um, acknowledge and understand when they're putting in a pool so a company that so this is something your contractor would actually help you out with a, a pool a company will get proper permits get in touch with the city they would know how far close to the boundary can the pool be put in this is something that i would not be doing my part is, right uh, what my part of the job is with regards to the transaction only yeah and what my point for this whole thing about surveys and easements and things like that is really for the buyers to know if they want to put a pool in that there isn't a sewer easement in the yes. backyard and the city will never allow a permit so yeah. if you really want to put a pool in and this is something that you want to buy this property specifically for you must do the research before you yes. buy it's not up to the sellers to say oh, oh we know everything about putting a pool in or yeah. not they might have never wanted to so yes so you would not know what's in the mind of a buyer it is exactly. really important for buyers to disclose that information and then these issues or these concerns can be addressed at that point according to the before specific before closing yeah. <laughs> before so offering the more before you offering. know what your goal is for the house the better off you are to obviously communicate to your realtor and then they will be able to help you or point out some of the issues that you may run into if you are really your heart is set on doing some type of renovation or pool or any other thing that you yes. are thinking about, right? And, and easements are not, not just um, 
um, utility easements. Uh, a lot of times properties are uh, set up such that your neighbors may have easements. And uh, I see that very typically in newer subdivisions, we see them wherever there are row townhouses with backyards. Yeah. Uh, neighbors have easements to cross over from the backyard uh, to access their backyard. Or and, shared uh, driveway, I see shared that. Shared driveways common. is very common. And shared driveways are actually more common in older, uh, some of the older Toronto subdivisions as well, uh, because right. of more tight spaces. Or um, laneways, laneways too. Yeah. Like this is the thing, we all need to have that information before we make an offer. So you know what you're getting and also what, you know, your neighbors and the city is allowing on your property. Absolutely. And these the easements are just stay at, these easements are stay with the property. You purchase the property as right. is. Correct. Um, they, they okay. cannot. This is fantastic. So to finish the episode, I just want to ask Amira, what is the one advice that you would give uh, first home buyers uh, uh, from the legal point of view? Um, Legal or practical, I'd say, is please consult professionals for any task that you're going ahead with. Um, do not rely on your realtor for legal advice and do not rely on your mortgage agent for real estate advice. Um, consult the proper individual, consult the proper professional and ask them their questions. And I, most people I know of or I work with are happy to answer their clients uh, to the best of their abilities. So please um pick up the phone and call it's as and easy as that <laughs> this is why we say don't wait until you have a purchase and that a, an agreement in your hand that's signed find a lawyer first get to know them get to talk to them really be able to i have i have you know not just you but i have a couple other lawyers that i really like to uh talk to and this is something that because i'm in the business i want to continue on the conversation because i know things change all the time too with the law absolutely <laughs> things and situations like covid was sure. new to everyone right and sure. presented new situations new ways of dealing with other lawyers and completing transactions yeah. and some things were great some not so and some i hope stick around so yeah Things change. Yeah, I, I well. absolutely. And I love that whole the key exchange thing too. that, you know, somebody, especially if they're buying a property, let's say a cottage or something that <clears throat> they're not that close to the lawyer that they're dealing with or the lawyer that is the, the listing lawyer and they can't get the keys from them that it's just there at the property. So whenever they take possession, yeah. they can go into the lockbox and get the key. I think that's one of the questions that I get asked a lot. How do I get the keys? I'm like, you don't have the property yet. Just hold off. Yeah. <laughs> Tell you the lawyer the answers all of these questions too and i'm i am in agreement with you collect i am happy that realtors help us out these days and set up a lockbox and the code is exchanged on closing once the money is exchanged absolutely for the buyer to just be at their property and get the keys right there i absolutely oh, this, really like that too. yeah this is totally amazing uh we really appreciate you coming here and if, can you give the viewers just your information once more if they want to contact you? Please do contact her if you would like to have more information or maybe a question that wasn't answered today. Uh, what is your information, Amira? Well, first of all, thank you to Colette and Araceli for having me. It has been a wonderful conversation with two beautiful ladies. Um, and uh, my information, again, is uh, I'm a real estate lawyer. The law office is Ask Law, A-S-K Law. And our uh, website is asklawfirm.ca. Please Google us and find all of my contact information there. And I'd be happy to share more if anyone has more questions. I we have to thank you. Thank you so much. And we're hoping to have you another time to talk more about uh, some other questions that our viewers have. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, oh, and, you, yeah. you blew me away. You blew I, me away, Amira. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank everybody out there for joining us too and watching. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon.